International Observe the Moon Night, organised by NASA and brought to you by the Scenic Rim Astronomy Association and Stargazers. My name is Farina and I'm a member of the SRAA. Our broadcast tonight is coming to you from the SRAA site at Old Laravel School, Laravel near Bow Desert. Right now you should be seeing on the map where we're located on your screens. Before we get started, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathering and the first astronomers. We pay our respects to elders past and present and um, emerging community leaders. International Observe the Moon Night occurs annually around this time of the year when the moon is near full quarter, first quarter, sorry. This year, COVID restrictions are bringing us together digitally to observe and share and learn about the moon with our fellow enthusiasts and curious people around the world. As we broadcast live tonight, we'd love to know where you're watching from. So please put your name and where you're coming, when you're watching from in our YouTube chat. And we will, I will read out some of those locations later on in the broadcast. Now, a little bit of background information about our clubs tonight. Um, Stargazers and SRAA are small amateur clubs that are fun, friendly, and a little bit geeky. We get together with like-minded people in a safe and social atmosphere to enjoy the night sky. Everyone is welcome to come along to our events and you can find out more about our clubs and our events from our Facebook pages and websites. We've got a lot in store for everybody tonight. So if everything goes according to plan, you'll be able to observe the moon from telescopes set up here at our Laraval site. You'll also learn a little bit about craters, see pieces of the moon, and find out more about the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. If you have any questions or comments about tonight, we'd love to hear them. So please, again, include your name and your question in our YouTube chat, and we'll hopefully be able to answer a few of these questions throughout the night. So without further ado, we're going to cross over to our first viewing of the moon with Natalie and Lindsay. So Lindsay, what are some of the key things that we should know about the moon to get us started? Well, Natalie, um... of the moon. So the, one of the first things that you notice when you look at the moon is it's round because it's basically a small planet. Um, it's about a quarter of the Earth's diameter. That's about 3,500 kilometres. It's roughly the, uh, the width of the moon is about the same as the width of Australia, to give you an idea. I've never thought of it like that. That's so easy for me to kind of picture now. Yeah, yeah that's good. Um, in terms of distance, the moon's about 400,000 kilometres away. So if you were able to take a flight to the moon, which you can't, of course, but if you could, you'd have to sit on your commercial jet for about two weeks to get there. Yikes. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that the moon's partly lit. So the upper part of our image there is uh, bright. It's, being re it's reflecting light from the sun, which is why we can see it. And the lower part is in shadow. It's actually the dark side of the moon. And the uh, phase that we see uh, changes over the moon's roughly 30-day cycle as it orbits the Earth. Uh, many people will be familiar with a crescent. Uh, and this phase we're seeing here is a little bigger than a half moon. So we call it uh, a gibbous phase and it's waxing, meaning that each uh, day it's getting a little bigger, closer to the full moon. What is it that makes those phases change? Can you tell us a bit more about that? We sure can. You'll see there's a diagram there on screen um, that I can bring up there. And let me just press the magic button so I can annotate. In this little um, diagram, you can see the Earth in the centre, and then around the outside you can see uh, the phases of the moon. So if we start here at new moon, uh, you'll see the light from the sun is coming from the left and half the moon is illuminated, but that half is invisible from Earth. So the moon appears dark, we really can't see it. A couple of days after that, we'll have a thin crescent and the moon will be visible low in the west after sunset. And then each night the moon moves further around, the crescent gets fatter until we reach first quarter, which is many people would call a half moon. Half the moon is lit up, that takes about seven days after the new moon. And a little later through, we'll have the gibbous phase, which is where we are at the moment. The moon is high in the sky in the early evening. And in a few days' time, we'll have the full moon, where the moon is directly opposite the sun, and it's all illuminated. 
and you'll see the moon rising low in the east in the early evening. Now, the point with full moon is that it's actually the least uh, useful time to observe because your friend, when observing the moon, is shadows. You want shadows to help show off the, uh, the detail on the moon and you don't get shadows at full moon terribly well. Past the full moon phase, you'll see the moon begins to wane. It gets thinner each evening. So we have a gibbous phase. Then we move through to last quarter. You'll find the moon, sometimes you can see it low in the western sky in the morning, say 8am or later. When you're on your way to work or school, you might notice the moon then. And finally, the moon becomes a very thin crescent. If you feel like getting up at, say, 5am, you'll see the moon uh, just uh, uh, set, uh, setting just before the sun. Um, right. So... It, in that diagram, it looks as though there's the same amount of moon lit up all the time, but it changes because of our position viewing it and its position in its cycle. That's right. That's right. It's all about the moon's orbit in terms of how much of the dark side and how much of the light side we can see. Right. So wait, you've mentioned dark side. Is that the same as the far side? No, it's not. Uh, an excellent question. Uh, the dark side of the moon is any part of the moon that is not lit up. So the uh, view we had of the moon a little while ago, you could see about two thirds of the moon was lit and the other third was part of the dark side. The far side of the moon is actually uh, the part that we never see. And this is quite an interesting uh, point of view. And you can see that from this diagram here. Uh, in this diagram, I've got three little guys. There's a guy with a yellow head on the earth and a guy with a green head who's on the near side of the moon, point him out there. And then there's a guy with an orange head on the far side of the moon over here. And the idea is that as the moon orbits the Earth, it actually spins on its axis, that is, it's having its day cycle, if you will, and the spinning on the axis occurs at the same rate as the orbit around the Earth, about a month. So if you like, the moon's day is about a month long, and because of that, you can see this poor guy with the orange head can never be seen from Earth. He's always on the far side. And that means that we humans here on Earth uh, couldn't see the far side until we were able to send space probes there. The first image was returned in 1958. Uh, and before that, we had no idea what was on the far side of the moon. Um, as we now know, that the, the far side of the moon looks quite a bit different to the near side. It doesn't have any lunar seas. We'll hear more about those later, or at least very few seas. All right. Well, is it possible for us to look at the moon again um, and maybe have, a, have you point out some things that we can see on its surface? Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Um, if we're able to bring our image of the moon back up at low power. There it is there. So when you look at the moon, you'll see that, that uh, the division between the uh, bright part and the dark part is the terminator. And that's where the sun is rising on the moon. If you were standing there, you'd see the sun rising. And just like on Earth, when the sun is rising, there are long shadows. And those long shadows are what make things easier to see. Um, you'll also notice there are some darker areas and some brighter areas on the moon's surface. The dark areas are known as seas. Now, they're not seas. But the people who named them 400 years ago thought maybe the moon was rather like the Earth and perhaps they were seas. We now know, of course, that the moon doesn't have any air or water, which means there's no way they can be seas. And the surface of the moon reflects this because uh, anything coming along to hit the moon will just hit it because there's no atmosphere to stop it. Whereas on Earth, things will burn up in the atmosphere. Many, many uh, bodies coming in towards the Earth burn up before they reach the ground. Also on the moon, because there's no air or water, there's no erosion, so craters can last for millions or billions of years. Wow. It's thought that the astronauts' footprints will be there for perhaps a million years before they're covered very, very slowly by impacts from the solar wind. That's incredible. You'll also notice that the, uh, those seas, uh, they have interesting Latin names because they were named about 400 years ago, but we won't use them. Instead of Mare Tranquillitatis, we'll talk about the Sea of Tranquility. Um, now, if you have a look at that image of the moon, very much up the top, there's a small circular dark patch you can see. That's the Sea of Crises. And to give you an idea of the scale, the Sea of Crises is about 500 kilometres across. If you look uh, below that, there's a line of three large seas. You've got the Sea of uh, Fertility on the right, the Sea of Tranquility in the middle, and the Sea of Serenity on the left. And then some of the other seas there, uh, right over on the far left side of the moon, you can see uh, a long thin sea, which is the Sea of Cold. 
and then underneath that, just above the Terminator on the left, is the Sea of Showers, a little further over the Sea of Islands, and then uh, right down the bottom, towards the right, is the Sea of Clouds. Now, I like the Sea of Clouds because one of the map makers uh, who first uh, made maps of the moon about 400 years ago had a different name for it. He wanted to name it after a group of French kings. So he called it Mare Bourbonicum. And in English, that means the Sea of Bourbon. Wouldn't mind visiting that sea. <laughs> yes, could be quite an interesting visit. Now, after the seas, you'll notice there are some lighter parts of the moon, and these are the craters, uh, the uplands, as they're often known, dominated by craters. Um, looking back on the moon, uh, it's a little hard to see on our image there, but we do have, uh, on the lower right-hand side, you can see one crater just on the Terminator. Yeah, I see it. And that's Tycho, which is uh, one of the most recent craters on the moon. It stands out quite well. There's another one, if you look on the left-hand side, just a little above the uh, Terminator, you can just make out the crater Plato. We'll have a closer look at those later. Um, one other thing you can just make out, if you go back to Tycho and look above, you'll see there are some white lines that all seem to be pointing to Tycho, and these are Tycho's rays, which are uh, great plumes of uh, material sent up by the impact that formed Tycho, which then came back down onto the moon's surface. Wow, well that's a great basis for us to start with, kind of the basics of moon anatomy. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing that all in a bit more detail later on. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Thanks, Natalie and Lindsay, and thanks to everybody watching at home. So, as I mentioned before, the broadcast is coming to you live from Lara Vale in Queensland. I don't know if you can hear, but there are some cows down there that, uh, that might be coming through on the broadcast. Um, thanks again for watching. Just a, just a reminder to um, post your questions if you have any for our presenters tonight, and also to post any comments or um, information about where you're from, because we're really interested to find out who's watching. Um, but next up is our member Riyadh and he is going to take us back in time to discover how the moon was formed. Tonight we're going to discuss several theories behind why the moon has formed. We'll first look at debunked theories and then the dominant theory. So the first debunked theory we talk about tonight is the co-formation theory. So in the early solar system, matter was orbiting the sun in what's called an accretion disk, as you can see in the picture here. Heavier chunks of matter gravitationally attracted lighter chunks of matter and they eventually as impact. It's considered to be a hundred million times greater in energy than the impact that made the dying cells go extinct. In this impact, a huge amount of heat, magma oceans were created, and a good portion of the Earth's crust was and mantle was ejected into space. Now, within this now orbiting matter around the Earth, or the proto-Earth, the moon coalesced into its own spherical body. One reason why this theory is supported 
is because it explains the tilted axis of the Earth. Another reason why this theory is supported is because the composition of elements in the Earth is very similar to the composition of elements in the Moon. Now, there is a little difference, and this is explained by the fact that Thea, the body that impacted the Earth that long ago, had a slightly different elemental composition than the Earth. Let's have a look at a video rendition of this giant impact theory. So there you have a proto-Earth, very hot, a lot of asteroids hitting into it. And now you have Thea, slowly but surely impacting into our proto-Earth, creating a huge collision. Thea was disintegrated, Earth, part of Earth started going outside its planet into the orbit of the Earth. And then over time, this mini accretion disk led to the formation of what we now know to be our spherical moon. And there you have it. Back to you, Farina. Thanks so much, Riyadh. So now I've come for a walk on our side here at Lara Vale to have a little look at the telescopes that we've got. I'm standing here with Greg, one of our members from the SRAA, who's got an H in Dobsonian telescope set up uh, with his iPhone. So you actually don't need a whole lot of technical equipment in order to get started. Is that right, Greg? No, not really. Um, this is probably the base entry scope if you were saying getting into astronomy, an eight inch Dobsonian scope like this one would be what you're after. Um, and you use scopes for all sorts of things, um, star clusters, galaxies, stuff like that. Um, but the moon is uh, probably your easiest target and one which we can take pictures of very readily. Something I get asked quite a lot um, every time I'm showing people through a telescope is, can I take a picture of that through my phone? Unfortunately, the answer for most of the stuff is no, but when it comes to the moon, the answer is absolutely, because the moon's so bright, your phone camera can handle it quite easily. Now, I've got a special attachment on here, but if you aim it just right with your hands, you can actually do this by hand. It's not, it's not any real big deal to do that. And... You can see there that we've got a pretty reasonable image of the moon with what is some fairly inexpensive equipment, particularly when it comes to the cameras. So while we were using um, some very expensive stuff to show you the pictures just before, um, you can see that this is actually doing a very nice job all on its own. So we've got some wonderful things there. We can see Copernicus just near the Terminator there, um, that, that crater that's just half in shadow. but. We're getting a terrific image and images of the moon are incredibly easy to get. So um, yeah, if you want to um, go to visit somebody with a telescope, if you do it while the moon's up, you'll be able to get yourself your own picture of the moon, no problem at all. It's you fantastic. Really it's really quite clear, really, considering it, it's, it's yeah, it, for just what attached. It is, it's, yeah. it's really, really good. Yeah. So Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Greg. Not a problem. Okay, so um, I don't know if you guys realise this, where you are today watching from, but it's been super windy here in Brisbane today, uh, well, and in Lara Vale as well, and, um, but it's turned into a calmer, much beautiful, less windy evening, which has enabled us to um, get set up and get ready to give you some beautiful images tonight. Before we go back to our next observation of the moon directly from our telescope though, we're going to go back to Lindsay and Natalie and learn a little bit more about craters and Maria. Formed, but that didn't really cover all the craters and all the bumps and things that we see on the surface. So what happened there? How did they get there? Well, Natalie, um, the... Um uh, you can understand what happened after the moon formed, which was around about 4.5 billion years ago, by uh, two processes, impacts and lava. 
um, both the seas and the craters that we see were formed by bodies hitting the moon, blasting out huge depressions. Hang on. Bodies? Well, what do you mean? <laughs> not human bodies. No, not that sort of body. Okay. No, we, um, asteroids perhaps is a better word. Think of a small asteroid somewhere from, say, 50 kilometres in diameter for the very largest seas and going down to perhaps 100 metres or smaller for uh, the, the larger craters that you can see. So uh, the impacts for the seas occurred very early, perhaps four billion years ago or even older. Um, there were lots of large objects in the early solar system zooming around and numbers of them uh, hit the moon. Some of them uh, most likely hit the Earth too, but the traces of those have been obliterated mm -hmm. over the uh, uh, billions of years. Uh, the moon was partly molten when these impacts occurred, so later these basins filled with dark lava, which is why they have a darker colour that we see today. Uh, craters formed from smaller impacts. Many occurred around that early time, but a few occurred later. Uh, there's about 2,000 named craters on the Moon, about a million that are uh, a kilometre or larger, and about a billion that are 10 metres or larger. Um, there were many early impacts on the Moon up until about 3.8 billion years ago, and then the rate of impacting uh, fell off quite quickly after that. Do we know why that happened? Scientists aren't positive, but we believe um, many of the objects that were going to hit something had hit something by then, and there just weren't as many left zooming around to, to hit things after that. We got okay. smaller impacts after those very large ones. Um, the, uh, you can actually see a couple of the more recent craters, many of the craters formed perhaps four billion or three billion years ago. But the most recent ones, there are two. There's the Copernicus, which formed about 800 million years ago, and Tycho, which formed about 100 million years ago. 100 million years ago. And we consider that recent. Yes, that's recent. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way. Um, and we saw earlier Tycho's rays. You can see in this picture here, Tycho is towards the bottom of the uh, picture of the moon, and you can actually see the rays radiating out. Oh, I can even, oh, let me go back one. And if, oh, sooner or later I'll go back. And if I bring this up here, I can annotate. And here you can see Tycho, and here's one of the rays going up there. There's another up here, wow. and another up here. So you can see where the rays are coming out from the material that Tycho blasted out, then fell back onto the moon. You can see some smaller rays up here on this crater as well. Many of the craters have these rays. Now, to talk about how craters form, we have a diagram. Craters uh, uh, fall into two categories, small and simple craters and big and complex craters. And the dividing line is about 10 kilometres in diameter. So with a small, smaller crater, an object comes blasting into the moon at enormous speed, between 20 and 70 kilometres a second, which is about uh, 70,000 to 250,000 kilometres an hour. And when it hits the moon, it vaporises and produces a huge explosion and melts the rock beneath it. It pushes this material down and away, and eventually when everything cools, you're left with a smooth bowl-shaped crater. Some of the material is blasted up and out of the crater and falls back around the crater as ejecta. So you get a sort of a particular pattern. We'll see that uh, later. You'll often get secondary craters and material you can see that's just been effectively thrown out of the crater. So here's an example of a small crater. This one's about five kilometres in diameter. And you can see it's a nice, neat little bowl shaped. And indeed, you can see several of the smaller craters around it are bowl shaped. You can also see a lot of these craters here that aren't particularly deep. And these are uh, examples of secondary craters where the material that's come out of the crater that falls back to the moon is moving more slowly than the original impactor. And so the craters aren't as deep. If you have a more complex crater, it starts out the same, but things go a bit differently because of the sheer size of the explosion. So you've got a lot of liquid rock underneath and there's a lot of uh, uh, pushback, shall we say, and uh, upwelling, particularly in the middle. So you end up with uh, a central bump, which becomes a, like a central mountain. And the crater might initially be, say, 50 kilometres deep, but the rocks on the moon simply can't sustain such a deep crater. And so, um, there's push up from the bottom and the, the rocks on the side often slump and subside and you end up with a terraced effect. So the crater is a lot shallower than you might expect for a really deep crater. Um, and of course, the final thing is that there's then volcanism where these craters fill with lava and that alters the floor of the crater. 
Here's a couple of different craters. This is Copernicus, which we'll look at later live on the telescope. It's uh, quite a recent crater, 800 million years, and you can see the central mountains, you can see the terraced effect around the edge, and you can see this material here going out. This is the ejector blanket that's been blasted out from the crater surface. And over here is a picture taken with Apollo 14, and you can see that the crater isn't as deep as you might expect. Um, it's still three or four kilometres deep, but uh, in the scheme of things, it's not as deep as it is wide. Wow. Here's another crater. This is Plato. Uh, this is quite a big crater. It's about 100 kilometres across, and you can see some areas where it's slumped there, and it has a smooth floor in the middle. But if it's... If it's so big, wouldn't it have a peak in the middle as well? You'd think so, wouldn't you? But that nice smooth floor is lava, and it's thought the lava is probably so deep that it's completely buried the central mountain, so we can't see it. Wow. Here's another kind of feature on the moon. We'll see this later live. This is the Alpine Valley, caused by faults where the moon's crust expanded and pulled apart, and the area in the middle slumped down. Um... I don't know if it's, surely it's not just on my screen, but there, there seems to be like a little, a, a crack within the kind of scratch formation there. Yeah, there is. It looks rather like a river flowing down the middle. And it's, this is a rill. It's thought that the rill is probably a lava flow or perhaps a lava tube that later collapsed. To give you some scale, this valley is about 110 kilometres long and 13 kilometres wide. If we have a look over here, this is an interesting crater. It's called Fromoro. It's a ghost crater. And what's happened here is the crater's been nearly obliterated by lava. You can see a bit of the edge here. There's a bit up here and just a hint of it round here. Wow, you can barely see you it. Can just see where it is. There are some craters that are even more ghostly than this one, but this is quite a good one, which we can also look at later. Here we have Clavius. This is the second largest crater on the moon. It's about 200 and 20 kilometres across, and it's interesting because it's down near the limb of the moon, that's the edge down here you can see, and because of that it's foreshortened, and so instead of being a circle it looks like an ellipse. It's not an ellipse, it is in fact a circle, but it looks that way. It's a very old crater, over four billion years old, and you can see several other craters have occurred since then on top of it and broken it down. Um, and then finally we can see... Uh, this is quite a good picture to show the kind of shadows that you can get on the Terminator. Here's the Terminator, the, the division between night and day. This is the Plato crater we saw earlier, and you can see how one side is casting shadows onto the floor. And then you've got these mountains here. This one's Mount Pico, and you can see it's got quite a long shadow. And these mountains have very long shadows. And this little dot here is a mountain top that's still mostly in shadow, but the very top of the mountain has been lit by the rising sun on the moon. Wow, that's that's incredible. I've never seen the moon in such detail before, and I hear we're going to hear we're going to see it in even greater detail a bit later on. Um, so this is all still photography. Do you reckon we could take a look live through a telescope? I think we could have a crack at that. So uh, what we're going to do is we've got Ben, um, who set his scope up behind us, and we're going to go over there and take a look. Um, I'm going to go and uh, ride, ride shotgun with Ben, so I'll just take my little kit of bits and pieces over, and we'll go and see what we can see live on Ben's telescope. So we'll just walk over to Ben. Oh, are you guys going to talk to Ben first? Should we? No, I think we should. You should at least show off Ben's telescope before I talk. Definitely. Okay. And thanks again, everybody, for um, joining us for International Observe the Moon Night. So we're out here at Lara Vale, and I'm standing with Ben, who's got a nine and a quarter inch Schmidt Cassegrain um, focused on the moon. So normally um, Ben looks at a whole lot of different things, galaxies, planets. But tonight um, we're going to learn a little bit more um, about in this you know, next look at the moon. Actually, Lindsay, we've actually had a question from a member of the audience. Um, Lawrence from Brisbane is asking us, can we visit the Sea of Bourbon? <laughs> <laughs> so yes. perhaps you might want to <laughs> answer that for him. Um, <laughs> fact, it might not be as fun as he thinks, I suspect. <laughs> I'll make a point in Ben's telescope. We'll actually, okay. we can see the Sea of Bourbon tonight or the Sea of, the sea of um, Clouds and... Uh, uh, I don't think any astronauts have landed there, but um, maybe Lawrence might live long enough one day to take a, a tourist uh, trip there to see it for himself. Good. 
have a look here with with uh, um, Ben, and you can see we've got the scope going, and we've um, we've got our um, view here, and the crosshairs, of course, are on uh, the crater Plato, which we saw earlier. Now, one thing you'll notice is you think, am, am I drunk? I'm having trouble with, with that image. It moves around. And of course, what we're seeing here is the uh, seeing. So we're looking through 100 kilometres or more of air. The air's moving a little bit. It's just like looking at something at the bottom of a swimming pool. You get that ripple effect. So uh, that is what we get when we observe things on Earth. Um, and the astronomers are always in search of great seeing. So we have quite reasonable seeing because we can see um, Plato there and you can see the flat floor like we saw before and up at the top left you can actually see the Alpine Valley and Ben might just uh, whiz us over there a bit. There it is there. So it's coming over, it's now uh, coming down a little bit. So it's just to the left of the crosshairs now and you can see the valley there when we get a nice clear moment of seeing. You might just be able to glimpse the rill down the middle. It is pretty hard to pick it out, but you can certainly see the valley. And you can see some of the mountains around the valley there. These are the Alp Mountains. And then the flat, dark area to the right is the Sea of Showers. And you can actually see a mountain if you look on the right-hand side, about halfway up, you can see Mount Pico that we saw earlier, which is casting a shadow. If we come back to the right, Ben, can we see where the Terminator is? You'll see things get progressively darker. You can see some mountains there with some very long shadows. And that's basically the Terminator there bleeding off. You can just make out a couple of craters barely being lit up by the sun there at the extreme bottom right. So if we go um, um, back to the left a bit and then we'll go up, we can see some other features. So we'll go up along the Sea of Showers. You can see uh, the crater Cassini there at the top centre. Now it's about top middle, uh, very near the middle of the crosshairs. Now it's a crater and it's got a smaller crater inside it. I might mention many of these craters are named after um, astronomers or other scientists, many of them very old. So Plato, of course, was a, an ancient Greek philosopher and Cassini was a scientist from the 1600s. You'll find many of them are named that way. Although there's a few where the uh, people who were naming the craters named them after uh, politicians of the time because that was a good way to get a bit more funding for the, for the research. Um, now just above Cassini we can see uh, Aristillus which is a, an interesting crater. You can see the central peak, it's top centre there. Um, and you can see the materials being uh, pushed out the ejector all the way around Aristillus. Um, and then if you go up a little bit beyond that, you can see Autolycus, and then to the right is Archimedes. Now Archimedes is quite an interesting crater. We zoom over there, you'll see. The thing that's interesting about Archimedes is just above Archimedes is a whole rough area, which is known as the Archimedes Mountains. And you can see what's going on here is that um, the body that hit that made Archimedes hit the moon at quite a low angle coming from the bottom of our screen and all the material that was excavated out of Archimedes ended up on one side of it and we have those mountains on that side. But if it came in at that kind of angle wouldn't the crater be more elliptical or like a long line? Why is it still a circle? You'd think so wouldn't you that it would be elliptical and indeed the initial uh, gash that the body would have made in the moon would have been elliptical but the explosion that made the crater was probably a hundred times bigger than the body. And so any elliptical shape that might have been there was completely obliterated by the explosion. And the explosions are nearly always circular, which is why nearly all craters on the moon uh, appear circular. Great. Um, actually, Lindsay, you've actually answered a question from uh, one of our members watching from Michael from Warrnambool, so, um, who's actually asked, are there any craters that are not circular? Um, so... You've actually kind of explained that okay. there. There are a couple that are, um, and it's thought that if the um, if the crater's not real big and the speed of the body coming in isn't really high so that there's not a big explosion and it comes in at a very acute angle, it's, a few craters are elliptical. And as we saw earlier, many craters look elliptical because they're on the moon's limb, even though they're actually circular. So if we go a little bit higher, we 
with a little bit more time. We're nearly there. If we go up and a bit to the right, we can see the jewel of our craters, which is Copernicus. Those mountains you can see at the top there are the top of the Sea of Showers. Um, and there we've got Copernicus. Now, this is interesting. You can see Copernicus doesn't look quite like the picture you saw before, and that's because it's just rising into the sun's light. You can see that the right-hand side of the wall is lit by the sun, but in the base of the crater, which is three or four kilometres deep, there's still no sunlight, so it's still dark. And this is where observing the moon can be quite interesting because if you were to take careful note of what you see and come back in, say, an hour, it would look noticeably different. And I'm told some very serious lunar observers will often try and time their observing and watch all night and watch the sun gradually creep across Copernicus's base, which takes about six hours. Okay, so we've got halfway up the moon. We can have a break there and we'll come back and go a bit further up later on. Just before we take a break, um, we've also got a question from Glenn from Burpengary. So Glenn's asked, why are impactors always travelling so fast? Are there any slow, are there no slow impactors? Well, there is quite a wide range of speeds. So we said between 20 to 70. Um, I couldn't give a definitive answer on that, whether there are in fact some slower ones. Certainly the secondary impacts after the uh, initial uh, crater is formed are much slower, perhaps two kilometres a second rather than 20 to 70. Uh, I guess you would expect uh, on average there will be impactors at different speeds and I guess it's possible there's a low speed one, but uh, I guess 20 to 70 kilometres a second is the best guess. Thanks, Lindsay. And thank you, everybody, for watching at home and putting in your questions. That's fantastic. Um, we're going to take a bit of a change of pace next and uh, go and have a look at pieces of the moon. Um, so you're going to have to give us a second because we have to go all the way to the other end of the field. So we'll see you again shortly. Thanks for joining us for International Observe the Moon Night, live from Lara Vale. Um, I'm over here talking to members of the SRAA, Pete and Greg, who are going to show us some pieces of the moon. All right, thank you, Farina. So we've had a look at the moon tonight at um, a, a long distance, sort of like a binocular view. We've zoomed in, we've had a look. Now we're actually going to get right down to a microscopic view of the moon and we're going to do that as part of this particular collection that we have here which belongs to Peter. So this is a meteorite collection. These are actually rocks that have come down from space. Is that correct Peter? That is definitely correct Greg. All right so in this collection here and you've got heaps of different rocks you actually have some pieces of the moon. Yep, I have about six examples here of actual lunar meteorites. Fabulous. So this where did these pieces actually come down? Like where where did where did they where did they originate? Okay, the piece you have in your hand there at the moment, uh, that was originally found back in twenty seventeen in uh, just outside of Morocco. Okay. In the uh, Sahara Desert. Yeah. And basically the nomads would go out into the desert mm -hmm. looking for meteorites. Now, when a desert's all of one particular colour, yeah. occasionally there'll be a rock that's jet black that just stands out from everything else that's out there. Okay. They would collect that, take it back to Morocco. The, the meteorite dealers would then look at them, analyse them, 
if they were meteorites, purchased them, and then they came onto the secondary market. Right. So th- this rock from space, it'll be traditional, well, typically quite black on the outside from um, when it's come down, burning through the, the atmosphere. Yep. Norm- normally they create a fusion crust. So as they come in and start to burn up, the yep. outer crust burns. But sometimes they've been sitting in the desert for quite some time, and that crust will just um, erode away with right. the wind. But it's basically local people in a very desolate area and they're picking up rocks which clearly don't seem to belong there. Yeah, and that's why a lot of a lot of other meteorites are found in places like Antarctica. Okay. Can you imagine the complete white whiteness of Antarctica yeah. and suddenly a rock sitting on top of the ice that does not belong there? Right, okay. So there's a lot of other places where meteorites might come down but we may not really recognise them for what they are. No, unfortunately I think most people would walk past them yeah. if there was one there and unfortunately probably 99.99% of what you pick up won't be a meteorite either. Right. I was just thinking if one actually landed in my backyard, I wouldn't notice it for being different unless there was like a... We're just having some yep. technical difficulties. I think people at home can only hear you on that mic. Right. Okay. So. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll share this microphone. Um, yeah, I was just saying if if a rock actually came down, a meteorite came down, landed in my backyard, I wouldn't actually know that it was a meteorite or anything different um, unless there was a smoking crater to go with it. Well, unfortunately, you wouldn't get a smoking crater. Oh, really? Uh, that's, mu- that's actually really disappointing. Yes, and a lot of people think that they think they're going to hit the ground, start a fire and things like that. No, it's really... They're just the same as when the Apollo missions came back, the ablative mm. shielding. Mm-hmm. It was just heated up long enough for it to actually make its way through that part of the atmosphere. Yeah. By the time they reach the ground, they're literally slightly warmer than the surrounding temperature. Right, OK. So we've got a piece of the moon. Um, so how did it actually get from the moon to here? Like, uh, how, how did it... So we've, we've established now it's a meteorite. How did it actually get from the moon? That is a really good question, and that's one asked a lot. Mm. What's actually happened, I don't know if you heard Lindsay talking earlier, yeah. and he was explaining about how a lot of the craters and stuff were formed on the moon. Mm-hmm. And the moon took massive impacts, and a lot of the ejector material that exploded out ended up escaping the moon's weak gravity and into space. And eventually Earth has passed through that space, and those particular pieces of the lunar surface have actually come through our atmosphere. So that impact has been powerful enough to not only um, create ejector, but ejector that's got enough energy to even leave the Earth's gravity altogether, and, yep. and, then, it, and then it hits us. That, that's fantastic. So, all right, so it's left, the, it's left the moon, it's come down to us, it's now a meteorite. Uh, I guess the final question is, how do they know this came from the moon? Now, that is, that's another really good question. So this particular material is known as feldspathic breccia. Mm-hmm. Uh, feldspathic refers to the mineralogy of the material yeah. and breccia refers to the texture of the material itself. Now what they've done is when they take these samples and they have them analysed in the lab using spectroscopy and chemical analysis, mm-hmm. they can cross check them with the pieces that were brought back by the Apollo missions, by the astronauts. Right, okay. And by comparing the samples they and being identical in chemical composition, they know they originated from the moon. Right, okay. So. We'll see if we can get a picture of this here and put it underneath the scope. All right, so there's actually a fair bit going on here in that that's this isn't just one rock we're looking at, sorry, one, one uniform rock. This has actually got a number of things in it and... Um, I noticed the word breccia that you used there. So I remember from my high school sciences that breccia was a conglomeration of rocks, yeah. so of different rocks. Now, on the moon, breccia can form naturally, but what also can happen is from a massive impact, it can actually throw various materials together with such kinetic energy to bond them into one piece. Right, OK. So that's why here we're seeing we've got some reddish material, um, grey, white. There's almost like white crystals in there, a bit like quartz. Well, there's not actually quartz, but there's barite, ilmenite, uh, chromite. Uh, one of the things people see of some of the lunar samples is a slightish green colour, which is chromium. Okay. Which is what we make the green glass bottles out of. Right, OK. Very common on the moon, but quite rare here on Earth. Right, all right, yeah. So... That is that is quite that is quite a cool story in that 
We have something which originated from an impact on the moon. That impact squashed together multiple pieces of material, then ejected it from the moon with enough force that it left the moon's gravity. It left the moon, came down on Earth, landed in um, in the Sahara Desert, was noticed by somebody not to be that sort of rock, um, and was then looked at and analysed and found to be a piece of the moon, which is, is quite a story, really. How, how rare are these? These are extraordinarily rare. Mm-hmm. Out of, even though meteorite falls in general are quite rare, actual lunar meteorites, there's only about 371 known examples. Yeah. And of this particular class, probably around 70. Right. Um, they vary very differently from the material found on Earth. But interesting enough, uh, Rehad was talking earlier about Thea, Mm. Theory, theory hitting the earth and yep. that's how our moon was created they actually found some locations in western australia and material they had pulled out of the earth is very similar to parts of their lunar surface right not exact but yeah. very very similar it's one of, and it's one of the only few places on earth they've ever found this material which leads to the story of Thea colliding initially with the earth when it was forming to actually form our moon wow that that's that's fabulous so so yeah, from from very small pieces of rock, um, that's that's quite a story. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So there we go. We've actually had uh, now a microscopic look at the moon of um, of pieces of the moon that have actually fallen to Earth, which is uh, a, a different way of observing the moon on Observe the Moon Night. Okay. Thank you. Back Thank to you, you Farina. Thank you, Pete and Greg. We don't actually have any questions for you live from our YouTube chat, but I had a quick question for Pete, which was, if I wanted to get started um, on collecting my own lunar meteorites, where should I start? Okay, Okay. a lot of people would normally say, I'll jump on eBay, well, this one's really cheap, I'll grab that. Unfortunately, most people would get ripped off there. Um, The key thing to look for is reputable dealers, Mm -hmm. and the most reputable dealers you'll find in the world are members of the IMCA, the International Meteorite Collectors Association. Yep. Um, they are very heavily monitored in what they do and how they conduct their business. Um, it is expensive to get started. Like a very small sample could, of a common piece of lunar would probably cost you 50 to $60. Okay. Then you can pay up into the hundreds of thousands of wow. dollars depending oh, okay. on what you're chasing. Yep. yep. Cool. cool. But it's but good, it's good to, know to know that there is an organisation that you oh, can trust to certain ways you can acquire some for a collection. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Great. great. Cool. cool. Thank, Thank you, very you very much. much. Thank you. All right. Well, if you're just tuning in, um, you are watching International Observe the Moon Night being run by the Scenic Rim Astronomy Association and Stargazers out from our the SRA site at Laravel. We're now going to cross to take our third and final look at the moon um, over to Lindsay and Natalie. other half of the moon through Ben's telescope. What can we see here? So we've still got a similar view to what we left? That's right. Uh, You can see on the right that we've got Copernicus. We've discovered we can make our crosshairs go. So there's Copernicus that we saw earlier. And the seeing has improved a little bit, um, which gives us a slightly uh, cleaner view. You can see around the outside of Copernicus these um, ejector blanket that's appeared. And then over here, you've got another crater, which is called Stadius, and it's interesting. I'll just move the crosshairs off it so you can see its central mountain. It's quite a nice crater with a central mountain. And you can see just below Stadius, there's a mountain range running along. That's actually the edge of the Sea of Showers. And above, we're into the Sea of Islands, which you can see there. So if we go for a little, a little bit of movement now, we can go up a little bit. And we should come to, here we go. I might add, uh, it's it's much more fun than you might think because Ben's using a, uh, one of those Game Boy type controllers to move the telescope. It's a brilliant setup. Yeah, it looks pretty good. 
Okay, so we've got a couple of small craters there in the sea of showers, and if we keep going up, um, we can come to, here we are, we've got, oh, where do we go there? Yes, we've got Framoro, which is, I think it's up a little bit further, isn't it? No, I don't think it's down a little bit lower again. We go yeah, we'll go across. And go. I think we've got to go down a little bit to get to Fomoro. Yeah, Fomoro is actually showing up quite well here. This is it here. It's. I didn't think that was it, but it, it's in fact showing up better than you would think because of the um, shadow that we're getting. Looks like there's a few ghost-style craters in that area. That's true. You'll often see, uh, particularly in, in the sea areas, you'll often see craters that have been uh, subsumed by the um, lava that flowed into the into the sea. It's just so strange to think of the moon as being such a, a volcanic, active hunk of rock. We're so used to it being this static, stale little chunk of cheese, but it had quite a, a violent and interesting active history. It certainly did. It would have been a rather unpleasant place to be with all those impacts occurring. <laughs> but the strange thing is it's like it's all frozen in place and many of the craters and things we see are three or even four billion years old and have hardly changed over that time. Um, I think if we come back to the left a bit, we can have a look. Um, where are we? Okay, we've got, let's just go down a bit, Ben. I've got kind of got lost a little bit there at our high power. Um, so while we're traveling, uh, Ben was telling us that he does astrophotography and he takes thousands, tens of thousands of photos and then, what, well, of a video? And then has to take out just the clearest um, frames and then has to stack those. So those beautiful still images that we were looking at at the beginning of the evening was the result of all of that work of, of isolating and then stacking those individual images to get that nice, crisp, clear view that we had of those first few uh, details that we saw of the moon. Let's go. Um, come back a little bit to the right to Stadius and we'll go straight up from Stadius. That should get us there. All right, up we go. So I've got our bearings now, I back at Stadius so. and heading upwards. Yeah, up we go. Uh, hang on. And okay, so there on the, we've got Ptolemaeus there. This is a big flat crater and you can see it's been filled with lava and doesn't have a central peak there. And then just up above Ptolemaeus is, um, I just love these names. Um, there's Alphonsus, Alpha Tragius and Azachel. So that's us actual there, um, Alpha Tragius there, Alphonsus. And then just out here is, um, all right, this lower one here is Davy, named after Humphrey Davy, the 19th century English chemist. And there's an interesting feature which we can just see. There's like a white line to the left of Davy. I'll move the cursor off that again so people can see it. Just to the left of Davy. And that's actually called Katina Davy. Katina just means chain. And uh, if you care to look up a picture of that, you'll see it's actually a series of about 30 tiny little craters in a line. And it's thought what happened, an object coming in at a glancing angle to the moon disintegrated before it hit the moon, and then you got bang, 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 as all the craters formed. And it's quite interesting to look at uh, when you get a really clear view at high power. Wow, like telescope. skipping stones on a lake, but on the moon instead. Very much like that. So um, if we move up a little bit further now, we'll, we can pick out quite an interesting feature. This one's called the straight wall, one of the more famous features on the moon. I'll put the Cross here, there you can see it's like a big straight vertical line, and then above there's like a little curving part. And many people think it looks like a sword, so the handle of the sword at the top, and then the blade pointing straight down. And it's called straight wall. Uh, it looks like a sheer cliff, but it's actually not. It's got an angle of about 30 degrees, and it's a couple of kilometres wide, but it's um, many kilometres long. So a really interesting feature to look at on the moon. And, of course, the important part to tell everyone out there is that the straight wall is in the Sea of Showers, otherwise known as the Sea of Bourbon. So, for those who are interested, you're staring right at it. So, if we go a little higher, you can see two craters 
uh, towards the top, moving to the right, we've got Petatus and Hesiodus. This is Petatus there. And then um, there's a number of other large uh, craters there. The one that I want to find is, where to go, Petatus, it is this one here, which is named after a 17th century German scientist. It's called Hell. Oh, goodness. <laughs> so there's a number of interesting named craters on the moon. Uh, if we go up a little further, uh, we'll come to a very famous crater. Here is Tycho. So and that looks different again from the angle that we're looking at it at this moment. That's right. And it's actually quite well shown at the moment. You can see again one side of it is in lit by the sun and the other side is still in shadow. And you can see the central mountain. I'll just move the crosshairs off it for a better view. And you can see the central mountain is casting a shadow as well. Um, and has that bright face as well that really makes it stand out exactly, in the center. Exactly. And you can see the sort of terraced ripply effect on this bright area there that's uh, been caused by the uh, glancing uh, light of the sun. If we go up a little higher from there, there's a large crater here. It's called Maginus. And then over here, we've got a really big crater. Whoa. Which is um, Clavius, which is the second largest in the solar system, so in the solar system, on the moon, get it right, at least on the near side of the moon. <laughs> and it's a very old crater, over four billion years old, and you can see there are several secondary impacts where smaller things have hit later after the original crater was formed. There's a whole chain of them. Uh, it's really quite a great object to look at. So do those secondary impacts help us date the, the different kind of features of the moon? They do. Um, obviously, you can make the simple assumption, well, if, there, if uh, this crater is over the top of that crater, then it's obviously newer. Mm -hmm. Knowing exactly how newer is a, is a different question, but you can do uh, average calculations and say, well, you expect about this many impacts of this size. It's still an imprecise science, but it's one way of trying to estimate the uh, age of different craters. Wow. And I guess when you're dealing with such large timescales, an estimation is close enough. That's it. Um, Although the reason I could earlier tell you with confidence that uh, Tycho was 100 million years old, in fact, I can tell you it's 108 million years old, and that Copernicus is 800 is because the astronauts that visited the moon gathered rock samples from the rays of those craters and analysed them. That's why we know how old they are. Before wow. that, it was all a lot of guesswork. So we've done like radiocarbon dating or something on those exactly. samples. Wow. And we go up just a little bit further, we can possibly see some craters right on the edge of the moon. Um, you can see they're starting to be foreshortened. I really like the view here. I feel like I'm kind of upside down as I look. This one here is the crater Meritus, and you can see it's got a central um, mountain and it's sort of foreshortened. We're looking at quite an angle. I'll put the, cur the crosshairs off so you can get a look at it. And then you can see bits and pieces over here which are edges of craters that are just starting to appear into the sunlight you're getting quite an interesting view there at the edge. Well, there you are. That uh, We've got up to the moon's south pole, having started at the north. That was a pretty good, a pretty good go. So I think a, a tip that you would give to future moon obs um, or people who might be interested in observing the moon themselves would be to look near that terminator, near that day-night line. Um, because that's where the shadows are. That's the biggest thing that I've, I've learnt tonight, is that you don't want full sun. You want that shadow of the, of the morning or the evening of the moon um, to get those shadows and see the detail. Absolutely. It's all about the shadows and there are guides. You can get software, you can get books that go through the moon and say when the moon is five days old, you can see this, and when it's ten days old, you can see that. And that helps you learn how to observe the moon for yourself. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ben. Thanks, everybody. Um, I actually have one final question for you, Lindsay. You've put in a mammoth effort. Thank you so much, you and Natalie and Ben, for showing us the moon tonight. Um, but before you go, Michael from Warrnambool, so thank you, Michael, for watching from so far away, um, has asked, can the crosshairs show the Apollo 11 landing? Oh, we can try. We can have a go. It is visible at the moment. It's in the Sea of Tranquility. 
I can have a rough idea of it if we just do a little bit of navigating. Um, so you've got to go, I'll show, give Ben a little hint as to where it is. We're going over here. All right, so because we've got such high power. Oh, here we are. Yeah, good. Thank you. All right. Um, it's going to be a little hard at high power, but we can have a crack. So, yeah, I think that's, yeah. Yeah, good. And you've got to come down a bit towards the bottom of it. Down a little further. And I think... Oh. Yes, it might be. I think we might still be up on the Sea of Serenity. It's hard to tell. No, we weren't. All right. That was obviously where we were. Um, that one is... Oh. We could probably do it on the low power view, actually. I know I can easily show you on the low power view. Um, it's harder to get your bearings when you're so it is. zoomed I think in. That's probably... Yep. Final bit of information, and we've got a couple more questions actually for for Pete. So we'll let you guys right. see if you can catch it, and, maybe and we'll come, come back, back to you. Yeah. How's that sound? All right. Let's do Excellent. that. Excellent. All right. Um, look, thanks again, everybody, for sending in your questions. It's, we're really appreciative of how you're getting involved. So. I have a couple of questions, some some difficult ones actually, for um, Pete, who just did a presentation about the uh, me lunar meteorites. So, Pete, John from Brisbane has asked, if we manage to efficiently collect elements from the moon, what would be the most valuable? Over the years, uh, there we go. A lot of discussion about this over the years. The most um, the most interesting one they're trying to find is a non-radioactive isotope called helium-3, which is buried in the lunar regolith. They do believe, yet though still unproven, that it could actually be used to create power extremely cleanly. Okay. So it'd be, like, handy. it'd be like having, in a sense, a tabletop nuclear reactor that's non-poisonous, right. so, if that helps. But, yeah, well, it's, it's the, the hard part, obviously, is mining it and getting it back down here. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> cool. Um, so, one more for you. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, Glenn from Burpengarry has asked, why is chromium common on the moon um, but rare on Earth? To be honest, I'm really not 100% sure of that. Um, I know the quantity on Earth is quite minimal, mm -hmm. but they have observed an area on the moon which is several thousand kilometres of it. In area, so that's a lot. That's, that's a, a hell of a lot there. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, so I think that is sort of um, one of the reasons that was sort of that is. But I, to be for mineralogy or geological reason, I couldn't I couldn't answer that. Sorry. No, that's, no, that's all right. All right. But, but thank you. you. Um, I should reiterate that uh, we're, we're not experts. We're just an amateur club who are really interested um, in this stuff. So, but um, yeah, we maybe we, 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 we do, and we really, really appreciate um, your questions. So, thank you very much. Um, so, I think we might be able to answer um, Michael's question uh, if we can just go back over back to our telescope. Hello again. We suffered from the standard astronomer's problem of holding the map upside down. <laughs> now that we worked that out, it's easy. And we've actually got it there. You can see um, there's a little crater just above the crosshairs. The crosshairs are very close to where the moon landing site would have been. There are three tiny craters, one named after Aldrin, one after Apollo and one after Collins. And you can see them in perfect conditions in a telescope at high power. Not able to see them on here, but we're very close there with the crosshairs of where the Apollo 11 landing site was. Uh, so there you are. Excellent, fantastic. All right, well, very soon. A little bit more about signals that we can hear from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So just stick with us for a little bit longer.
since I... Okay, so for one of the final things we're going to do for International Observe the Moon Night is we're actually going to try and observe the observer. And to do that, we're actually going to try and get signals from a probe that's currently in orbit around the moon. So this probe's known as the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It was launched in 2009, and it's a NASA probe that's actually taking very detailed images, amongst other things, of the moon. So... We have an extremely detailed scale model here of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's highly accurate, um, right down to the bumps on the solar panel with a Lego on it, which is actually on the actual probe. So it's in a polar orbit around the moon. This we're going to call our moon. And so a polar orbit is that it travels over both the north and the south pole of the moon. So it'll be travelling around like this, going around the other side, and coming around like that. And so it's doing multiple scans like that and taking really detailed images um, right down to footprint, footprint trails of the astronauts that walked on the moon and tire trails of some of the later missions that actually had a lunar rover. So we're actually going to be trying to get a sense of the signals that are coming off this particular probe by doing some homemade radio astronomy, which is something that a couple of us have just started to get into. So this is the piece of gear that we'll be using to try and do that. And uh, Peter, I have to say, this thing looks like it was stolen from a Navy destroyer. Um, it does. <laughs> so what actually do we have here? Okay, so this is pretty much a rather cheaply put together setup. Uh, what we acquired here was an old 2.1, uh, 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi parabolic antenna. Mm -hmm. Uh, I picked that up for about $60 on Gumtree, believe it or not. <laughs> right. So, but what, what we're trying to do, so at the moment we had this aligned up, the signal would come down, hit the main grid, bounce up into here, mm -hmm. then continue its journey down the cable, and we'd reach this little piece here called an LNA. Okay, and what's, for, it, what's an LNA? Oh, an LNA is basically a, a low noise amplifier. Okay. So when you think of a, the signal that we're pick, trying to pick up is really weak. And we want to try and amplify that. So that's the purpose of the so, load. So how, how, how sort of weak is the signal? Okay, well, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is putting out around, in the telemetry signal, which is what we're trying to look at, around about five watts. Mm -hmm. And five watts is about the equivalent of a walkie-talkie. That's not much. From about 400,000 kilometres away. <laughs> that's really not much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I see why we've got addition and amplifier now. That makes sense. And all, all it basically there is runs into a small software-defined radio. These are readily available for around 40, 50 bucks, depending on the type you want. And then from there, straight into a computer with some software, and we can start actually monitoring signals in the sky. Right. So we've got a few other bits going on here, um, just in the shadows. So we've got this big beefy thing here. This is one of our um, telescope mounts. And actually on the other side, this white tube is actually one of the telescopes we've been using to um, take images of the moon. So um, well, you'll also notice that we have a hyper accurate um, piece of wood that's actually holding the antenna together um, and many, many cable ties, which of course one of the, is the fifth fo um, basic force of the universe. So we've got all of these things hooked together and the idea is I believe that the telescope and this will be tracking the moon at the same time so yeah. we know what we're looking at. Yes, that's why we set these up in parallel with each other. So as, as long as that telescope is looking at the moon, we know our, our dish, which is rather directional, yep. is aimed directly at the moon as well. Right, okay. So when we've got the... Uh, do Have we got the, the probe in the right position at the moment? I'll just have a quick look now. To see sure. The current location of the probe. And unfortunately, it's currently heading around the back side of the moon. Okay, so... So we can't actually get a live signal. But and it was, what, five, 15 watts? Uh, five watts. Five watts. And I'm gathering that five watts is not enough power to punch a signal through the moon. No. 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 Okay, <laughs> right. So we're going to have to um, basically go with one we prepared earlier, yeah, I think. We recorded one earlier, and hopefully they can play it for you now. All right. So, and, and basically, on you'll see like a waterfall pattern there. And on the left-hand side, there's just a thin white line travelling along. Yeah. That is the actual signal coming from the LRO. So how do we know that that was the LRO and it wasn't just some random signal um, or, dare I say, aliens? Like, how, how do we know that that was likely the LRO? Yep. Okay, so when we're, when we're searching for things like this, we work in what's called the S-band. Yes. And that's, where, that's the band that all satellites work in between 
approximately two gigahertz and four gigahertz in radio frequency. So it's a, it's a frequency range in the radio. Yeah. yeah. And then each particular thing has a particular wave um, radio frequency that it transmits on. Yep. And we know that the LRO transmits at 2.271 gigahertz. Okay. Right. And so we actually, I, I was there with you when we got this uh, trace. We actually did see that we got it within the, the right band. It was the yep. right, we're within the right frequency that we're after. Um, was there anything else that told us that it was the LRO? Right. One of the big things is when you sit there and go, well, is that really it? Yes. But the most interesting part was as it passed over to the far side of the moon again, we lost the signal which definitely concluded to us that we had the LRO the whole time. Right. So actually one of the most important things of saying we got the LRO was losing it. So it was losing the, the It was losing the signal at the correct time. Yes. So hopefully you'll be able to see on the screen there that we actually did get a signal from the LRO. The timing was perfect um, that we lost the signal at the correct time. So um, from a fairly cheap um, homemade radio telescope setup, um, which include pieces of wooden cable ties, we actually managed to get a signal from the LRO, which I, I think is pretty impressive for a backyard astronomy it's group. It's pretty exciting at times. <laughs> All right, brilliant. Okay, so that's us. We actually managed to pick up something from a deep space probe going around the moon. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pete and Greg. Um, so that wraps it up for all of our presentations tonight um, and thank you very much for everyone staying with us on YouTube for International Observe the Moon Night. Um, I'm just going to just hopefully you can see a little bit behind me about our site here at Lara Vale. We don't normally have the lights up this brightly. Um, obviously we've had to <laughs> okay, thank you. A link to the YouTube um, event will be available from both the Stargazers and SRAA websites if you want to go back and have a look at the recording at all. Um, and if you missed anything or had trouble getting the feed, um, we'd love you to go and watch it and um, also recommend it to your friends. So thanks again um, for being with us tonight. Stay safe and keep looking up.